Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're very excited to be here with Curious Objects, our host, uh, Ben Miller, uh, and several of our esteemed exhibitors, Carrie Emberman from Kentshire, Daniel Crouch from Daniel Crouch Rare Books, and Keegan Gopert from Les Illuminures. I'm also very excited to have with us tonight uh, my friend Mark Addison, who is uh, the author of Cocktail Chameleon and an entertaining expert. And he has graciously agreed to come on uh, to kind of start the uh, blended spirits night correctly by giving us a signature cocktail. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, put that up on the screen after Mark has had a chance to uh, to take over um, and show us a little bit about uh, what it is that he does so well. So thanks, me thanks so much, Helen. Um, thank you for and thank you for asking me to be a part of this. Uh, this talk tonight, uh, when you asked me to do this and I thought, well, what kind of, what signature cocktail could I come up with for the winter show? And it dawned on me immediately to do my winter rosé sangria. It's a great cocktail for winter time, uh, hence its name, the winter sangria. Um, but it's also a nice amalgamation of uh, the, the transition from this, from the holiday season into winter and also brings a little bit of ray of sunshine from summer because I'm using rosé wine for my wine base in the sangria. And it's a it's kind of a hybrid cocktail between a classic sangria, which is typically served cold, as everyone knows, and a mulled wine. Uh, but what makes this a true sangria is the proportions of the base spirit to the sugar and the fruits and the way that you let them macerate as you would a cold sangria. And then you would add a nice chilled wine, anywhere from a nice deep dark red all the way down to a crisp uh, you know, uh, Chenin Blanc or Fumé Blanc. Uh, again, we're using the rosé because it has a nice full body white flavor color and as well as going to get brings in a lot of the freshness that uh, this cocktail is known for. So to get started, you can either use um, a pot on the stove, so you're going to be mulling it, or if you happen to have a, 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 a slow cooker at home, uh, you can use that and just kind of set it and forget it, which is fantastic. So I'm going to be using like a little glass pot so you can see as everything goes in together because that's the fun of making a cocktail. So I went ahead and made half a batch earlier because I wanted to have some in my thermos ready to drink with you guys. Um, and if you're following along with me at home, everyone should receive the recipe for a full batch. I'm using a, a full bottle, full 750 milliliter bottle of wine, but I broke it up in half. So I'm going to make half of it now. So when I call out the recipe, um, you'll know at home you should double that because it's on the, the written recipe that you have. So in my pot, I'm going to add um, some frozen cranberries. So I have a quarter cup of frozen cranberries here. You can use fresh cranberries if you like. The frozen ones are great because they've already broken down that hard um, skin of the cranberry. So it's going to really uh, give out much more of that cranberry essence. And I'm adding um, two tablespoons of granulated sugar. You can use turbinado sugar if you like. Uh, but don't use like a light brown sugar or even a dark brown sugar because it's really going to change the balance because they have a lot more molasses -y flavor in it. So you want a nice bright sweetness to it. And then I'm going to add uh, the zest of a uh, half of an orange. If you're making the full batch, you'd use a whole orange zest. You can use a vegetable peeler, you can use a grater, whatever is easiest because it's going to sit on the stove for a little while. And then to that, I'm going to add um, an ounce of fresh squeezed orange juice. So after you peel the orange, you can uh, juice it, so then you're using the whole orange and not wasting anything. And then two ounces of a nice fresh apple cider. You can use a bottled side, uh, apple juice, but if you use the ju apple juice, you wanna use a, a unfiltered apple juice because it has a nice viscosity and it's gonna help with the mouthfeel of the cocktail. So I'm using fresh apple cider because I live in Vermont and we have apple trees. And um, to that, we're gonna be adding an ounce of bourbon. Um, so at this point, if you're making a chilled sangria, you would let all of these ingredients uh, sit in the refrigerator covered uh, so that they can, the fruit can macerate and all of the flavors um, will, uh, you know, blend together really nicely and then you would add your wine. Uh, but we're going to do this on the stovetop. And so what makes this more of a mold type sangria is the spices. We're going to add a small uh, cinnamon stick. We're going to use a half of a... Um, uh, vanilla bean that I've already split in half and then one clove and then I'm going to take this and I would pop it onto my stove just to let the sugar melt 
And then after everything is melted, I'm gonna go ahead and add my wine. So I've got a half a bottle of wine here left over and I'm gonna pour that into my pot. And then I would just let this simmer for about an, 30 minutes to an hour. If you have a slow cooker, it's really great. You just leave it on low and let it go until you're ready to use it. And a batch cocktail kind of like this and perfect for winter because it has nice warming flavors and it's a warm cocktail. The great thing about making batch cocktails, especially for Zooms, is that um, you don't have to get up from your, your couch or your, or your desk or wherever you are uh, doing the Zoom from. So I happen to have a thermos full here and I have a nice vintage glass. I love using clear glass. I call the glass where the cocktail attire for your cocktail. Um, and in my book, Cocktail Chameleon, we photographed each cocktail individually in their own glass. So the book is really uh, a celebration of glassware as much as it is about cocktails. And this is a vintage uh, glass mug. I love it because it has a nice elongated bowl, a little bit of a fluted rim and a really pretty uh, low handle here. So it gives a nice elegant and a nice heavy sham which is great for serving warm drinks in. So I have my cocktail already prepared and it has this beautiful ruby red burgundy kind of color to it, um, which actually kind of matches <laughs> my cocktail napkin. And it was pointed out earlier in our rehearsal that my jumper matches my cocktail napkin. So I always say a signature cocktail should really be about celebrating uh, your own personality and um, sharing your signature cocktails with your friends becomes an anticipated part of entertaining with you. So naturally, you should uh, do some color coordination here with your outfits. Um, so here is the Winter Rosé Sangria. It's a fantastic cocktail, a nice cool evening uh, to celebrate the winter, the winter show. So cheers. Well, thank you, Mark. That is just about the most delicious introduction that I've ever received. Um, <laughs> Anyone who's interested, well, you can follow Mark uh, on, on Instagram uh, at the Mark Addison. Um, lots of lots more tasty treats over there, so take a look. Um, and, and thank you all for joining us, and hello, uh, and, and welcome to what is the, the third annual Curious Objects Live podcast event uh, with the Winter Show. Um, I, I can't believe that this is actually our third year doing this, um, our, our third live show. Uh, and of course, this is our first time doing it virtually. So um, for those of you who have been with us um, in the past couple of Januaries, you can expect a few differences this time around. Um, for example, none of us are wearing pants. Um, also, we usually save the cocktails for after the show, but this time we've decided to start before the show. So you might notice that the panelists are a little extra um, scholarly tonight. Um, and yeah, in addition to this live event, our discussion is being recorded um, to publish as the next episode of the Curious Objects podcast. Um, I mean, assuming nothing goes terribly wrong tonight. So um, whether you're with us live right now or listening to this in podcast form, uh, well, it is after all five o'clock somewhere. This panel is called Blended Spirits. So I think you know what to do. Um, seriously though, I'm thrilled to be part of this fantastic lineup of Winter Show virtual events. Um, a huge thank you to Helen Allen for making it possible um, and to today's panelists. Who are, we have in the red corner, hailing from Oxford, representing Daniel Crouch Rare Books, purveyor of maps, atlases, globes, charts, plans, prints, um, crayon drawings, napkin sketches. Uh, we have the coincidentally named Daniel Crouch. In the blue corner, Damien from Chicago, from Les Illuminaires, specializing in illuminated manuscripts, ancient jewelry, books of hours, and generally just really old shit, the one and only Keegan Gottford. And in the other corner uh, here in New York, representing Kentshire Galleries, dealers in estate jewelry, the one who makes you say, thank God they included a woman on this panel, <laughs> Carrie Emberman. Token female. And I, of course, am Ben Miller, a uh, dealer in antique English and American silver and jewelry of uh, SJ Shrubsoul. Um, anyone who has questions as we go through this event, leave it in the chat and we will do our best to address them in due course. Um, I wanna say, you know, one element of the winter show that you might not have heard about is what happens 
on those very rare occasions when there are no visitors in the aisles and we dealers are left to our own devices. Um, Helen, of course, will remind you that these are very, very rare occasions, but- It never happens. <laughs> That's right. Hey, hey, Ben, can I ask a favor? Um, yeah. Could you could you try using your computer mic for a moment? I feel like we're no. we're, um, we're getting a little bit of reverb, and uh, I want to make sure everyone can hear you properly. Sure. Sorry for Sorry, interrupting everyone. everyone. Little technical um, hiatus here. But it is true that it never happens. The show's never empty. It's always filled with throngs of people, right? Daniel, you're looking so serious. Doesn't happen for very long. <laughs> well, I just needed a little bridge there. So it's a rhetorical device, nothing more. Is this any better for you? The feedback has gone away, but the volume is de depleted. Gosh, what about this? That's Perfect. Like Perfect. Right Perfect. Perfect. Yay. OK, we'll go with that one. Um, so if you can just hypothetically imagine the aisles of the winter show devoid of um, customers and us dealers lounging around with nothing to entertain ourselves but each other, um, well, what do you imagine we might get up to? Um, I mean, obscenity laws prevent me from being too specific about this, but we are today going to show you a bit of the behind the scenes chatter that a fly on the wall might hear at the winter show on say a slow Tuesday afternoon. Um, and it's true that one of the things we do sometimes talk about is the actual objects that we've brought to the show. Um, so today we are going to introduce you to a few alcohol related object from our respective inventories. Um, now I'm eager to talk about the object that I brought but I don't wanna be selfish. So I'm going to kick this off the bat to Daniel, um, who has, of course, brought a, a wonderful map. Um, Daniel, why don't you tell us uh, what's going on with that map behind your head? Certainly I will. Um, if you're anything like me, what you've been missing in the last year is a little bit of travel. I've been stuck here in my barn in Oxford, and I was quite looking forward today to going uh, into the office to pick up this map. But then this happened to me. And I decided that perhaps I wasn't going to go into the office. Um, so uh, the map is now appearing like I am virtually from Oxford. The good news is it may be five o'clock somewhere, but it's 10 p.m. now. So unlike Mark, I haven't got half a bottle of wine that I've deliberately emptied half of. I have very carefully emptied my other half. And I'm working on the second. Um, so I'm going to take you on a journey, but this journey is not just in space. I'm going to take you on a journey in time as well. And we are going back to uh, one of my favorite places. Um, we are going to the Gironde in France, and we are going to Bordeaux. And this map here is the Carte Vinicole of 1855. And for those of you who drink as much as I do, uh, you will know that 1855 was the year of which French wines were classified. And this was a genius idea of uh, Napoleon III, not the very short Napoleon, the slightly taller Napoleon, who was his nephew. Um, and his plan, in line with the uh, great exhibition in Paris in 1855, was to classify the wines of, of, of France. When he said the wines of France, he really meant the reds of Bordeaux and a couple of whites for good measure. And this map shows, as you can see, the Gironde River running through here. And I'm gonna be able to, using my wonderful technology of my Mac, wow. zoom in and give you a, a little detailed tour. So there is Bordeaux and there's Aubryon, which you will all remember as one of the five first growth clarets. And this map and this procedure is how the clarets were classified. And this was done by a Mr. Dufour du Bergier, who is the president of the Chamber of Commerce of Bordeaux, it's a cunning marketing ploy. And it was done on the basis of nothing more sophisticated than reputation and price. <laughs> and they were divided into five classifications, premier cru down to cinquième cru. And you'll see originally there were four premier cru. And uh, the more astute of you will know that there are now five because uh, Mouton Rothschild was elevated 
to become one of the top five. Nothing to do with the fact that the richest man in the world at the time happened to buy the vineyard. Um, and you'll see here the two main areas of interest on this map. I'll try and do this a little bit slowly so you don't get too seasick traveling. Oh, and just a note also for those listening to this in podcast form, uh, you can see picture, pictures of this map and, and everything else we're talking about at um, the magazine antiques.com slash podcast. Because it's really a bit rubbish doing a little visual tour on, on, on a podcast, really. Exactly. Sorry, I didn't realize that little detail. Um, so here we are in um, Puyak and uh, on, on the left bank. And that's the region where the red wines are. And then further to the south of Bordeaux, you'll see down beyond Cadillac, not the car, where we have the white wines. And you'll see here, for those that have this on screen, Chateau du Quem. And the wine, the map rather wonderfully, provides details of both. And so here in the bottom right of the map, he's just trying to zoom in, is a picture of Chateau du Quem. I have a little anecdote to go with this. When I was at school um, many, many years ago, a very good friend of mine's father was a solarius at Queen's College here in Oxford, where I am, and he kept a very fine cellar. And as a 13, 14 year old Daniel, I uh, persuaded my friend to, uh, while his parents were out for the afternoon, to let us go wandering in the cellar. Some 30 years later, I found this, uh, the, the, the father of my friend drunk after a Gordian town, walking back to his, uh, his house. And he slapped me on the back in a very jovial mood with a cigar and an undone bow tie and said, Daniel, 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 I always liked you. You always had great taste. And I said, oh, why? He says, when you raided my wine cellar, you really did some damage. And it turns out those sweet little innocent uh, half bottles of white wine that I've been drinking were none other than his very fine Chateau de Chem collection about 30 years ago at about three or $400 a pop. So <laughs> some, some damage was done. And I, I, so I look at this back with a great deal of fondness. And there we have the I only- You appreciated people, it. The two goats there for the whites. And then uh, the, the five goats are color coded as you can see here, according to the key. And then we go up to the top and we have a much more detailed inset map that shows Chateau Lafitte, Little Vignette, Chateau Margaux, and then rather wonderfully, all of the famous vineyards. It's like, it means like a, a wine cellar of my dreams up here on the left banks of the Gironde. And so uh, I couldn't contribute to a cocktail hour with a cocktail map, but given that I, I, I can't drink spirits anymore anyway, I thought it was a good idea to go with a red wine. And so that is my uh, drinking object for the ages. And, would have been at the Winter Show this year, were it not for the fact that we are uh, all homebound and Zoom bound. So, if anyone has any questions? So, Daniel, let me know. Yeah. Why was this map actually made? I mean, who was it made for? What was the intended audience? Well, was it was it, made is it for the documentary, or is it? Uh... It was made in 1855 in the, at the uh, time of the um, Great Exhibition in Paris, and it was made really as a marketing tool for the Bordeaux. Um, Chamber of Commerce, and it was made by the president of the Chamber of Commerce of Bordeaux to, to bring their wines above all others by giving them the classification. People love things when they're graded and when they're better. And this classification, which was really a marketing tool done, you know, nearly 200 years ago now, um, they've held true. And you've got investors around the world buying these very wines because they appeared on this very map in 1855 in those classifications because that year they were the most expensive ones. And in your opinion, are the more expensive wines the better ones? I haven't tried them all yet. I'm working on that. It varies. Well, that's a hell of a picture. Thank you, Daniel. Um, why, don't we, why don't we jump over to Carrie? Um, right. You've got something uh, a little more glitzy for us. Yeah. I have. I actually brought it, but now it seems comical when I look at it. <laughs> Probably <laughs> should pull it up, and I, I don't know how to do this. Helen is really. Oh, amazing. look at that. There it is. There it is. Um, so I brought to the party um, a cocktail ring because it seemed germane. And uh, 
because I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the cocktail ring. This particular one is platinum with a, I would almost say kind of a mild color change Ceylon sapphire in it. That's about eight carats. It's French, which actually um, the genesis of the cocktail ring is, is American, but everyone catches on and everyone starts doing it. Um, it historically, um, the cocktail ring starts uh, 1920s America during prohibition because they come up with cocktails. And I don't know this, everyone's probably gonna like drag out this old chestnut, but cocktails were invented because the alcohol that they were using like bathtub gin, this kind of thing was undrinkable. So you made cocktails to disguise the taste of the terrible alcohol. Um, I myself don't drink cocktails. I, I'm a mezcal gal, but were I to drink a cocktail and I was in the twenties, I would be wearing this cocktail ring, which the more I thought about it, um, you were, if you were a flapper in the twenties, you were, it's kind of the original right hand ring. So you would wear it to sort of draw attention to the fact that you were holding a cocktail and that you were like a wild gal. So, it, and it, and to that end, it was very typically sort of a gem set ring and it was a flashy ring and it, and it was let everybody ring. know. And it let everybody oh, I'm getting know. a little reverb here. I'm getting a little reverb here. But, um, but for whatever reason, they were typically uh, colored gemstones. They, this one is, it takes up a lot of real estate on the, on the finger and it's really like, look at me. And it's not supposed to be an engagement ring. It's just supposed to be like, good time, Charlie. I have my ring. I'm drinking my cocktail. I'll, you know, it's supposed to call attention to the cocktail and to your, the fact that you were sort of an empowered gal who was busy drinking cocktails all day long because you were, you were fun. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I actually thought, if you, if you think about the history of rings since the dawn of time, they're, they're meant to sort of um, symbolize eternity. They're meant to commemorate occasions, sentiment. That's, that's typically how we think about rings. We think about them uh, as memento mori in memoriam. We think about them to, uh, there's a whole genre of like um, acrostic rings that exist to communicate little secret messages. Then a turn of the century, engagement rings come along, which were handily um, developed by the diamond industry to get you to buy rings. <laughs> but this is like the first time that a ring comes along just for fun. It's not really supposed to be conveying any other sentiment other than I drink booze and I'm fun and I've got money. So, and, and this trend continues from prohibition in America and then sort of takes root, as I said, this ring in particular is, is French, but, um, and, it, and it really holds on until the fifties. And it's kind of while dovetailing with the idea of uh, women's lib or women taking on a new role in society, it's also just supposed to be fun. And it's really, to my mind, I think the first time that a ring comes around that is supposed to, to communicate that. So I'm a fun gal. I would happily wear this ring. I don't, I don't know what else I can blather on about, but- I'd but, wear that ring too. Thanks, thanks, thanks Keegan. Can, can it's yours. I think it would look lovely as a man's pinky ring as well. But, you know, I, I, I as a gal that, this is my own personal ring, but I'm often wearing a cocktail ring because even though I have, you've got money in your... Well, you know, I actually have the hands of the crib keeper. They're like, as my mom always says, they're like little, we both inherited my father's little like cocktail wiener hands. But for some reason that does not stop me from drawing attention <laughs> to my truly hideous hands all the time because I love wearing rings. I love being able to see my own jewelry. So that's what I got. And uh, you know, I think I'm overdue for a cocktail, but reporting live from New York.
it's me, Carrie, at Canshire. Carrie, can men wear cocktail rings too or? Sure, um, why not? I mean, booze is an equal opportunity sport. And, and I was amazed that when you were doing the intro for the whole, uh, how you made it seem like all of us dealers when it's a quiet moment are just talking about our own inventory instead of drinking, which is the actual truth of it. Um, so cheers to that. You made us seem sophisticated, Ben. What's on, t tell me about the, um, the design of this ring. Because it, I mean, you, you talked about the rings sort of in, in the, toward the end of the 19th century, you start to see engagement rings, you see, but that's a very different style from. Uh, it, exactly. From it's stylistically, instead of being a romantic thing, you start seeing, particularly in this ring, which looks comically miniature when I'm, um, it, you're starting to see sort of like one toe in the industrial, sort of the real uh, industrialized modern design of the 30s. You're seeing clean lines. It looks very efficient. It's a fast looking ring for a fast gal. Um, and you see a lot of the real hallmarks of the um, deco period, which are these geometric sort of abstract, uh, structured, very sculptural elements that come into play around this time. This is probably dead on like 1930. So you're kind of, you're already past like the true prohibition, but it's looking, it's, this is to my mind, sort of a classic cocktail ring because they are specifically not necessarily like diamond engagement rings, et cetera, et cetera. And later on, as uh, during the war, we move away from platinum, you see them in gold as well. And you see them, they are an exuberant, fun thing. Who made it and for whom? I don't know. Um, I, I know it has French hallmarks on it. So it has a poisson. Uh, the French typically mark on the back of their rings here. So it has, you know, a French platinum mark. It is not signed. Uh, to my mind, when I'm looking at, when I'm looking at French jewelry in general, I already feel like I'm looking at something that is made to a much higher standard than the rest of the world thinks about jewelry. Um, the French are, are just working uh, at a complete, they, they have a completely different mindset about, uh, I would say quality and proportion specifically. I, I would guess that twere I to be encountering this ring for the first time, I probably didn't even look to see if it had French hallmarks. It just looks French. It has that sensibility. French statement ring, bit classy, but large. Yeah, well, you know, I'd be, I'd be just fine with this ring. I'll have you know, Daniel, it's available. <laughs> Okay, can we hop over to Keegan and go uh, way, way back in time for a minute? That's okay. We can do that. It's only Chicago, it's like six hours for me. <laughs> so, what so, have you got for us, Keegan? Yeah, not a not a ring. I, well, I have a, a uh, scrappy manuscript, but a very interesting one and totally fitting our theme today. I mean, I could have brought a book of hours with a calendar with scenes of like someone picking grapes or making grapes, some little tiny picture or a right. uh, Yeah, I mean, we've, we've had some great imagery, but I think this one just really nails it. Um, and it's so interesting. Um, this is a manuscript in vellum um, probably about the size of a shoe box, like a man's sneaker box, or that's the dimensions. Um, it's written in the, you know, circa 1425 in Italy, probably Bologna. And it is the statutes for regulating the wine trade and transportation of wine in Bologna. So statutes meaning laws and regulations, but it really gives us some really fascinating uh, uh, insights into people's relationship with wine. I mean, heck, I mean, even when I go and 
buy wine in Chicago, which has the highest uh, tax on alcohol in the uh, United States. Um, it's something that we encounter. If we enjoy alcohol, we're probably going to be taxed unless we're making it ourselves. So um, this is a really very rare document that survives. There aren't very many of these uh, that exist. Um, if they do, they're in Italian or other public collections uh, where a lot of these statutes for particular cities live. So, I mean, this is written in Italian. Um, it's really gonna be used for the interaction between you know, city the government officials and the guilds and then how they're going to then interact with the citizens of Bologna. Um, so it, re, you know, it regulates the cost of wine um, for individuals, the cost of wholesale wine, um, the special prices that people in the military get for their wine. A big one, a big one, really important is, that go, they go on and on about, is it actually about the rules concerning the mixing of water with wine, okay? So you can't get down a watered product, okay? This is really important, um, which is funny because in the history of wine, um, if you look back to antiquity, uh, the Romans, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, even the, you know, the, the uh, Egyptians and Mesopotamians, they, they would have thought we were just complete heathens, not mixing um, our wine with water. It was, in, back in antiquity, you always cut your wine with water. It was a common practice. So here, I think it's for different reasons where they're trying to make sure <laughs> that these merchants aren't taking advantage of the public. Um, um, but then I thought, well, it, you know, I was always taught in history, well, they're mixing wine with water, which they might actually be doing um, at home, you know, with a strong product. And wine also had a much higher alcohol content than we think of today where, you know, if you're drinking natural wine, it has to be under 12.5% alcohol, you know. But anyway, so um, you would think that they were mixing their alcohol with water to, you know, help fight like cholera, you know, water sources being clean, you know, the alcohol limiting the bacteria. Another really interesting thing that this goes into are the rules and regulation for how much wine a citizen of Bologna will receive daily and children. So anyone want to guess how much wine you receive per day at a, as a citizen of Bologna? Any guess? Daniel? I'm going with 750 centiliters. Okay, Carrie? Consumption. I have no clue. I mean, I would give it to the kids first. Ben? If this is like universal basic income, like this is the <laughs> kind of, I mean, you're a citizen, you it. get perks, you get perks, you get wine for they, free. They had, they had a plague, so you have to have a, yeah, you be like <laughs> every plague. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm guessing uh, three drams apiece. Uh, okay. Okay. So it's actually two liters of wine per day. Oh, I'm going to Two it. liters. Wow. Yeah. I kid you not. And it's stated in the statutes. Wow. And children, um, children are able to get uh, under 14 years of age, get 1.5 liters. So they get yeah. just a little bit less than the adults. So give you an indication of who is uh, drinking wine in, in you know, the early 15th century Italy. Um, but it's really fascinating. Um, this is, uh, it went to a, a private collector who is, collects, um, actually collects uh, wine, uh, uh, both, in the bottle and then books all about it. As you saw from, from Daniel, there's such a rich history. Um, I actually got a present. I got the wine encyclopedia this uh, Christmas, last Christmas, which was fascinating. It's a great one. Um, and uh, so anyways, this is just a really fascinating document um, that gives us this, you know, all these insights into not only the trade and the guilds, I mean, the other big part of it is like the regulations for um, men who are moving wine throughout Emilia Romano. Uh, um, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's cool. Um, so, and also like though, you know, I, I think the, the thing that gets me that I like the most is just how much wines people actually were able to consume. Um, I mean, that well, that goes individually, but that you're actually allowed to get for free. I mean, so, I mean, that's cool. Um, 
So, I mean, it looks really scrappy as a manuscript. It's not full of all the gold and gilding, but the, the content is so fascinating. Um, anyway, so that's what, I, that's what I'm offering today. Well, were women included in the wine ration? Yes, they were. All citizens, men and women and children. Yes. Because the problem in the Crouch household was, was that um, 15 years ago, my wife and I used to split a bottle of wine over dinner. And then she was pregnant or breastfeeding for the better part of four years. And after four years, she wanted some of my bottle. <laughs> and, and well, so we had to open a second bottle every night. That, 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 that way lies bad news. Yeah, I'm, we're, it, we don't, we try to share, but it ends up that, well, we do share, but it comes out of like a bottle of peace, you know, the Beaujolais Nouveau is in season right now. So that's what we've been drinking. I just actually, I love this quote from Hemingway too, which he said, a person with increasing knowledge and sensory education may derive infinite enjoyment from wine. And I really believe that's true, hundred percent. I love wine, so. I've always enjoyed that quote from Dorothy Parker. One martini, two at the most. Three, I'm under the table. Four, I'm under the host. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to, to, to making a, a Mark's cocktail, too, at some point, when I have the time. We got a question uh, here for you, Keegan. Shoot, what's the who question? Got, so, was it, who got the free wine? Everyone. Who got the free you wine? You get a wine. Everyone did, wine. yeah, yeah. There's nothing more than, I, I love getting free wine, um, you know? So uh, yes, the, no, the citizens, if you were a citizen of Bologna, which, you know, that, you know, Bologna, in the, I mean, had a huge, I mean, for medieval standards, a very large population. Um, they were a huge mercantile um, city, but also they had the University of Bologna, which is funny that we're getting a statutes manuscript from Bologna because the university is probably the most famous university in the Middle Ages to study law and uh, men from all over Europe would travel there to study um, law at the university. It's the oldest university in the world, isn't it? Uh, yes, I, 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 I think so. He says is it? Is it? No, I thought, I thought it was an English university that was the oldest. No, I'm afraid not. Is it Oxford, Bologna? Oxford, Oxford and Cambridge come shortly after it. Oh, good, good for them. Someone I love Bologna. America. Let's go. Someone's actually saying that Salamanca is Salamanca. The, okay. Okay. The, but Bologna is pretty old. Yeah. I think we're quickly turning into another kind of uh, event here: <laughs> the history of universities. There's a question um, about: Was there a ledger that kept track of who got the wine? Not that I'm aware of. And those, those types of documents may exist, um, perhaps, but um, not, in, not in this document. And one other question um, that someone just actually emailed to me. What uh, the, the question was, uh, so Bologna, everyone got free wine. Is that throughout uh, Italy or was that, just, was that just specific or do we not know? That's just specific to, to the city. Um, and of course they had more lands than just within the city walls that uh, within that region. Um, so yeah, it doesn't include an area outside of, uh, of their city limits. Well, this has really been an education. Um, I think our policymakers could really take some lessons from uh, what Keegan's been telling us about uh, medieval Italy. Ben, you got to turn on your video. We want to see what you're doing behind those dirty <laughs> black screens. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I have to apologize again for these uh, technical interruptions. Um, I'm having some audio issues here. Uh, but if I do this, I think you may be about to see two of me. As far as I can tell is a good thing. Um, Double vision. Yeah, but maybe I'll shut off one of me and leave you with just the one. Festival we'll events. We'll see how that cool. works. Oh boy. I have my um, two liters of wine. I'm not, I'm not sure. Would, I think after a year of pandemic that I would have figured out how to use Zoom. 
Uh, some of us are just slow learners. But I think it's I think it's my turn now to to show off a little. And um, you know, as as some of you know, I'm a, a dealer in uh, antique English and American silver. Um, what I've brought to show and tell today is a piece of antique English silver. Um, this is an object which dates back to uh, 1751. Nice thing about um, silver uh, from England is that we typically know exactly what year it was made. We also typically know who made it. And in this case, it was made by a silversmith named Paul Crespin. And I'll tell you a, a little bit more about him in, in a moment. But you might um, be interested to know, first off, uh, just what the hell this thing is. Um, it is uh, highly apropos of today's conversation. Uh, it, it might look a bit like a colander. Uh, and that's not entirely inaccurate. It's actually uh, what um, sometime in the late 19th century antique dealers decided to call a strainer. Um, now, uh, you might use your strainer for you know, boiled vegetables or the like, but this kind of strainer was really used for uh, alcohol and uh, specifically for punch and for wine. So in fact, um, the best indication we have is that these types of objects were actually used for uh, straining oranges and sometimes uh, lemons. Um, the notion was, well, of course you could make a punch. Uh, Mark uh, showed us a sort of a version of a punch uh, earlier, which involves some um, uh, you know, straining. Um, so it's familiar to a, a, a contemporary drinker. But um, back in the 18th century, they also liked punches. They also liked um, doing all kinds of wild and wacky things with their wine. Um, you know, we're not talking about the, uh, the erudite uh, wine connoisseurs of the 1850s that uh, Daniel has told us about. Um, we're talking about people who really just wanted a good buzz and they wanted it fast. Sometimes what that meant was adding copious quantities of sugar to their wine. So, in the 17th century, you find sugar boxes that were kept on the table out of which you would take spoonfuls of sugar and dump them straight into your glass of wine and stir it up for drinking at the table. Um, and if that gives you the willies, well, yeah, me too. But these, um, these strainers became popular. You know, there are a couple of them dating from the 17th century, but mostly you find them in the mid 18th century. Um, and the handles, which are typically quite long, are meant to bridge the size of a bowl. So you place the strainer over the bowl, you squeeze your orange into it, and you wind up with either a sophisticated and, and delicious punch, or you end up with a flavored wine, uh, mold wine, um, something along those lines. Now, um, if you're thinking, well, okay, sounds good, but wouldn't this all have been done in the kitchen? And why would they need a nice piece of silver in the kitchen? Um, it's true, you know, in the, in, in the kitchen, uh, implements, cooking implements wouldn't have been made out of silver. There was no point in paying for your servants to have silver. The silver was there to show off to your um, fellow arist aristocratic buddies. Um, so in fact, you know, the very existence of these objects suggests to us that um, these punches were actually being mixed up in uh, common areas. Uh, hence the uh, very expensive material that the uh, implements were made from. You can also see this incredibly sophisticated uh, pattern of piercing. And I think um, Helen may be able to show a, a um, sort of exaggerated image of that. Give me what uh, you want, the, uh, the photo or the, 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 uh, the stencil? The, the stencil, if you could. Yeah, give me one second. So, the, you know, of course you need the liquid to go through, you need to stop the seed. So you need little perforations, much like a colander, um, but why stop there? So what they did, what the English silversmiths in the mid 18th century did was, there was a, a kind of arms race of increasing sophistication in the patterns of piercing in these objects. There you can see um, a uh, sort of a, an abstract illustration of what the piercing looks like. Um, and the remarkable thing to me about this is to create that pattern of piercing, the tool that they used was actually a saw. So you would 
uh, pierce the, the surface of the silver and then stick a very narrow saw blade and saw out every individual perforation. So this is done by hand laboriously over the course of dozens, if not hundreds of hours. And of course, one slip of your wrist, you, uh, you know, cut between one perforation and the next, the entire piece is ruined and you have to start over. So we're really talking about an incredible level of um, skill and consistency. Um, this particular strainer is really one of the best examples of, um, of that piercing that, um, that I've seen from the mid 18th century. It's incredibly ambitious, incredibly elaborate. Um, and I think just uh, really haunting and, and, and beautiful. Um, I mean, you wonder almost if it's wasted on a piece that's sort of dumped into a bowl. Um, Crespin, you know, this, this silversmith uh, was a, a Huguenot immigrant um, to England, you know, uh, fleeing France after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, um, you know, the tamping down on religious freedom, which led so many uh, French Protestants to, um, to cross the channel, uh, either to go to the Netherlands or across the channel into England. And fortunately for the English, they uh, brought many of their best craftsmen with them. So uh, Crespin is just a, a great example of a, a silversmith who would never have found himself in England if it weren't for this political and religious squabble. Um, but he brought with him the, all of the techniques and the, the refinement of continental silversmiths and put it to use in, in England. He actually ended up um, uh, working on royal commission. Um, so, so you know, rose to serious heights in the world of 18th century craftsmanship. Um, so there you have it. Uh, I, I love this piece. I think, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but it's, it's a piece that we've owned at the shop for a very long time. We bought it a long time ago, paid a fair bit of money for it, thinking it's a wonderful, wonderful object. And it turns out it's one of these funny sort of specialized things that it's difficult to, um, to, to drum up interest for. I can't, uh, I can't figure why. Um, to me, it's really just a stupendous and, and beautiful, beautiful object and a, a marker of this wonderful period of um, both creativity, but just unbelievable technical mastery among uh, English silversmiths. So, Ben, what year was it from? We have a question from one of the- uh, Yeah, the year is 1751. So right smack in the middle of what we think of as the Rococo period um, when, you know, flourishes and embellishments and uh, decoration are in vogue. Um, so hopefully somebody who's listening to this right now is going to want to um, purchase this uh, piece. Uh, hopefully someone is going to want to purchase some of the other pieces that um, uh, you have talked about um, on this program. And, uh, you know, as per our agreement, I imagine um, Daniel and Carrie and Keegan, that you'll uh, you'll give me my fair commission on those sales. So bottle in the wings. Absolutely, and uh, I know you say that the, the the punch was cooked in the common areas. It just so happens that uh, I have a, a little print on my laptop. Oh, look at that! Which is uh, William Hogarth's Modern Midnight Conversation, where you can see punch in practice. And That's fantastic. Notice, You'll notice that it's a scene very similar to my house at about 11 o'clock last night, um, but more closely. <laughs> um, and, and why do I have this on my laptop? It's because if you were at the Windsor Show last year, you'll have seen that we had a punch bowl globe. That was, there you go. Oh, sorry, it's very difficult, there we are. Um, that was made for uh, Joseph Banks on Captain Cook's first voyage. Or after Captain Cook's first voyage. So this is now in the National Library in Australia. So I think what they need for the simple like late Georgian design of this, this is 1772, is a Rococo strainer. Excellent idea, Daniel. See, this is this is the other thing that antique dealers get up to in the aisles of the winter show is buying and selling to each other. No. Figuring out the angles. The three antique dealers on the desert island with one chair, and they all made a very good living and died rich men. 
<laughs> I, I, I do see a question in the chat about um, the little bird on this strainer. Um, and if you can see it here on the handle, there's a little engraved picture of a bird. And that's simply a family crest. It's a mark of um, ownership. Um, unlike a coat of arms, you know, a coat of arms, a full coat of arms can uh, typically in English heraldry be uh, identified with a single individual uh, or certainly with a family. Um, crests are uh, much more difficult to pin down because many different families may have shared the same or very similar crests. So we can't be quite sure exactly who this was made for, although there is a sort of a list of aristocratic families who would have been candidates for it. It's interesting that it's a Huguenot uh, silversmith because I mean, I know nothing about silver, but um, at that same period, in about 1745 to 1750, all of the map engravers who were any good working in London were Huguenots. Mm -hmm. There's always a big overlap. Yeah, well, it, there's a strong argument that the very best silversmiths anytime between about 1705 and, and 1750, the very best silversmiths in English in England were generally speaking Huguenot. Well, that's how, uh, you know, that's how global trade and genocide work. <laughs> hand in hand. We had, we had another question. I think it was actually from when Keegan uh, was, was speaking about uh, Bologna. There was a question, was everyone a citizen or were they wealthy landowners? Or do we know? That's a good question. Um, probably not everyone that was, were, was coming in and out of Bologna were, were citizens since the document talks specifically of also about merchants coming in and out of the city. Um, and they might be from other parts of Italy, from other parts of Europe. Um, and people and, and students also. So I, I would think there's only a small amount of, of a part of uh, the population of Bologna that are actually citizens. And we know that also because of the university and people coming all over uh, Europe to, to uh, they might be you know, from Paris or from London or from other parts of Europe. They're probably not you know, city, citizens of Bologna. So I don't think they would have been entitled for their free wine. They'd have to actually pay for it which is a drag. Gosh, I mean, what's even the point of being in Bologna if you don't get your free wine? Yeah. I recommend if anybody wants to go and have a gourmand experience and eat and drink, like uh, Bologna is a great place to do it. The food, the wine, everything is good there. All right, well, now we're turning into a travel show. So I think, uh, I think we, Maybe had best cut this short while we still can, um, particularly given the decreasing level of the uh, cocktail in my glass. Um, thank you everyone so much for, for joining me. Thank you to, to the panelists. Um, this has been a great deal of fun. I hope it's thank been you. at least a little bit educational. Um, and again, a, a huge thank you to Helen and to the Winter Show um, for doing this and, and the whole series of events that you've been doing. It's um, you know, nothing can replace the physical um, in-person annual show, but uh, what you're doing is a huge breath of fresh air in the middle of a pandemic. So I think we're all very grateful for that. Well, thank you all very much. It's really been, it's been a fun hour and uh, I miss, miss seeing you all and harassing you in person, but uh, excited that I at least get a chance to see you face to face on Zoom. So thank you all very much for attending and everyone, uh, just so that they know, uh, a copy of this uh, will be made available both on, uh, obviously, Cur uh, Curious Objects will be, uh, will be airing it, and then it will be available on the Winter Show site as well as uh, on the magazine Antiques. So thank you all so much. Thank you for being here. Pleasure. And don't forget to check out the show. All of these dealers have phenomenal works, not just the ones that they've shown today, but so many, many, many more. So it's definitely worth uh, many, many hours <laughs> of perusing. So thank you.